Why did NASA abandon its plan to colonize Mars? Well, before we get into that, did you know aerospace scientists were so confident in their abilities that several plans were drawn up over the years, serving as a blueprint for human colonization of the planet Mars before the end of the 20th century? This is Explorium, and welcome to our channel. Today, we are revisiting those old visions for some science fiction fantasy from 1940 to 1960, and the upgrades that took place were just remarkable. So let's begin. Let's venture on a thrilling journey back to the 1940s. Guided by the visionary Dr. Werner von Braun, often hailed as the father of rocket science, he's the mastermind behind NASA's Apollo program, which famously landed the first humans on the moon. In his early career, von Braun was in his homeland of Germany, busily redesigning ballistic missiles for the Nazi army. His most notable creation during the time was the V-2 rocket, marking humanity's first encounter with a long-range guided missile. The war ended and the United States military saw potential in von Braun's talents. They recruited him, eventually transferring him to NASA, where he served as the director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. But that's not where our story gets interesting. Amid his dual roles, von Braun found time for a peculiar passion project, Project Mars. This 280-page novel wasn't just any story. It was a blueprint for a manned mission to the Red Planet using the cutting-edge rocket technology he was actively developing. The book not only featured a riveting narrative, but also delved into complex mathematics, all authored by a genius rocket scientist. Von Braun's futuristic vision was brought to life with a stunning Technicolor artwork with Project Mars, outlining a grand plan indeed. The first step was to establish enormous rotating space stations in low Earth orbit, generating artificial gravity. These stations would serve as a launch pad for a colossal fleet of rockets designed for interplanetary travel. Among them was the impressive Ferry Rocket, a fully reusable space plane and booster system that would ferry materials to an orbital construction site. From orbit, the Mars fleet consisting of transport ships, cargo haulers, and Mars landers would be assembled. The crew would inhabit spherical sections of these ships, each powered by clusters of liquid-fueled rocket engines using hypergolic propellants, which self-ignite and combine under pressure. Once ready, the Mars fleet would break free from the Earth's gravity using the Hohmann transfer window to navigate the shortest route to Mars. Von Braun estimated that it would take 260 days, or eight and a half months, to reach Mars. Upon nearing Mars, the ships would adjust their trajectory and descend into low orbit around the planet. Then, the crew, in their spacesuits, would set up a ground station using supplies carried down by the massive lander vehicles. After fulfilling their mission, the vertical rockets would take off from the surface and rejoin the orbiting fleet. With the crew safely back in their transport ships, the fleet would initiate a return trajectory to Earth. In the late 1940s, von Braun's plan seemed entirely plausible to rocket scientists at the time. However, one crucial factor eluded their knowledge. Mars's lack of atmosphere and the absence of water and life. Von Braun's grand vision of glider-winged rocket planes for landing on Mars, though imaginative, was a logistical challenge that could not withstand the test of reality. Fast forward to the late 1950s, and the quest for human space travel to Mars was evolving with refined plans and the introduction of cutting-edge technologies. This era marked the dawn of the atomic age, as nuclear energy had been harnessed to produce electricity. Rocket scientists were quick to see the potential of nuclear energy for long-duration space journeys. Dr. Ernst Stollinger, a close colleague of Werner von Braun and a former Nazi scientist now working with the US government, stepped into the scene. Stollinger modernized von Braun's Project Mars concept, adapting it for the atomic age. His innovation replaced the hypergolic chemical rockets from von Braun's visions with nuclear electric spacecraft. However, Stollinger's Mars plan garnered significant attention and was even featured on American television in 1957. Walt Disney, known for his weekly program Disneyland, dedicated an episode titled Mars and Beyond to explore the planets of our solar system. And to know what is even more exciting, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. It featured imaginative animations envisioning life on Mars, Mercury, and Venus. To balance these flights of fancy, Disney included a segment with Von Braun and Stollinger, who showcased models and illustrations of Stollinger's atomic electric Mars transport. Just as in Project Mars, the components and materials for the colossal nuclear ship would be transported into space by chemical-fueled ferry rockets. The heart of the nuclear electric ship was its nuclear reactor, situated at the bottom of the craft's central pillar. This reactor harnessed nuclear fission to produce a constant supply of thermal energy. 
This energy boiled silicone oil into steam, which drove a turbine generator, powering the entire ship. At the top of the craft, a giant circular panel served as a condenser, converting the steam back into a liquid state, ready to fuel the atomic generator again. The ship's main engine was located halfway down the central pillar. It featured a platinum metal grid, electrically charged to vaporize cesium particles. The ionized cesium atoms created an electrical field, propelling the ship through space. In the center of the condenser circle, the ship housed cargo space and crew quarters for up to 20 passengers. Mounted on the front of the ion engine was the Mars landing craft. Upon reaching Mars's orbit, the lander would be deployed, using a giant parachute as an air brake, and then its main rocket motors would fire for a controlled landing. When the surface mission was complete, the crew would return to the lander and blast off using an ascent module at the top of the vehicle. This method mirrored the approach used by Apollo astronauts to leave the moon's surface. The journey to Mars, however, was no easy feat. With a nuclear electric thruster, it would take a staggering 13 months to reach the Red Planet. Four months were needed just to escape Earth's gravity, followed by seven more months to reach Mars, and an additional two to settle in a Martian orbit. Stollinger envisioned a fleet of six nuclear ships embarking on this deep space odyssey. At the time, there was great uncertainty about what Mars held in store. While Stollinger's technology showed promise, with many of his ideas still relevant today, the major flaw was the exceedingly long transit time, exposing astronauts to the perils of microgravity and cosmic radiation for over a year. Despite this challenge, the ideas represented in Mars and Beyond marked a significant step in the right direction for interplanetary exploration. It's time to embark on the thrilling 1960s, when NASA's human spaceflight program was hitting its stride. Mercury and Gemini missions had successfully achieved the historic feat of putting the first Americans into space reaching orbital velocity and even conducting exciting extravehicular spacewalks. The Apollo program was forging ahead at full throttle, and at the center of it all was the iconic Dr. Werner von Braun putting the final touches on his magnificent Saturn V rocket, the very vessel that would propel the first humans to the moon and back. It was the golden era for human space exploration, and NASA was already setting its sights on the next monumental challenge, Mars. The vision was clear. They aimed to send astronauts to the Red Planet by the early 1980s. Even unexpected players like Ford Motor Company tossed their hats into the ring with their Mars Transportation System proposal. However, for this thrilling journey, we'll hone in on a white paper presented by the Boeing Aerospace Division in 1968, a proposal that stood out as one of the most legitimate mission designs. Boeing brought forth a groundbreaking concept, a nuclear thermal rocket propulsion stage. This innovation was vastly different from the nuclear electric ion thruster discussed earlier. Here's the scoop. It still relied on a nuclear fission reactor, but instead of generating electricity, it took a more direct route. The red-hot core of the nuclear reactor was used to supercharge the propulsion system. Liquid hydrogen fuel was pumped directly into the scorching reactor core. Now let's talk about cryogenics. By cooling hydrogen to ultra-cold cryogenic temperatures, it transformed into a liquid state. This dense, super-chilled liquid fuel was then introduced to the searing nuclear reactor core. When it met the heat, it explosively expanded back into a low-density gas. This gas was then skillfully funneled through the engine nozzle, creating a powerful thrust. It's like a hybrid between conventional rocket engine and electric iron thruster, offering an ideal balance of both thrust and efficiency. This nuclear rocket technology represented a significant leap in space propulsion, and NASA was already actively developing it under Project NERVA. The possibilities were electrifying, promising to open new frontiers in space exploration with the power and efficiency required to make the journey to Mars a reality. <laughs>